This is actually a guideline about bonding. Tonight, a grandfather ends his hunger strike after a visit with his grandsons. Uh, we have no tolerance for this in our communities, nor does Tainanega Mohawk Territory. Plus, police partner on a drug bust in southern Ontario. Don't worry, Santa Claus is indeed coming to town in Nunavut this year. And Nunavumiat are ready to welcome Santa Claus to the territory. Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Earlier this week on In Focus, we brought you the story of a grandfather in Terrace, British Columbia, fighting to have contact with his grandsons. It's a complicated story, as so many ones involving child custody and visitation are. Charlotte Moore Jacobs now with that story. And what is the story? This is actually a guideline about bonding. Desperate to be reunited, nine, this grandfather is going public on his experience with his dealing with Indigenous Child Family Services birthday. to see his grandkids. And I'm going to like to submit this to the ministry and have it on file so that in future uh, social workers that have to deal with this case could see that the bond we have with the grandchildren is there. Lauren of Terrace, British Columbia has spent the last two years fighting for access to his two grandsons, both under the age of 10. The kids grew up at Lauren's with their parents until a domestic situation landed the boy's father, Lauren Jr., in jail. The mother took the sons and moved in with relatives on her side of the family. But shortly after, the mother lost custody of the boys due to poor mental health, and Nizga handed guardianship over to the mother's relatives. They've been there ever since, and have never entered into the care of Nisga Nation's Child and Family Services. But since the First Nation CFS has been involved in transporting and supervising visitation for Lorne to see his grandkids, Lorne has been pushing for Nisga to intervene in times where the kids' guardians cut off Lorne's contact with the kids. It's taken a big toll. My wife, as soon as she hears their voice, she'll break down and cry. APTN News reached out to Nisga Nation for an interview in the matter, but they declined to comment. Lauren says he's held off on going to court, still believing that his band is the right fit for dealing in matters involving Indigenous child custody and visitation. But now, he's not so certain. NCFS ministry, it either has to be revamped, scrapped, or find an alternative situation to deal with people. And also that the guidelines that are given to them throughout Canada or BC that they have to follow, they have to adhere to them. I'm on the 14th day of a hunger strike dealing with NCFS. At the time we interviewed Lauren on December 15th, he was three weeks into a hunger strike. He had gone six weeks with zero contact with his grandkids. He believes he's being punished for a comment he made on November 10th at a meeting with Nisga CFS. My comments at that meeting are as follows. If I lived in the dark world I used to live in, I may have done something to bring this case to attention. What I meant by that is what I'm doing now, a hunger strike. Lauren says RCMP called him saying they were investigating him over alleged threats he had made at that meeting. But he was never charged. Lauren has a clean criminal record and no allegations against him for abuse or neglect. He says he just wants to ensure his grandsons are safe and happy. Kids are now, the grandkids are now living with mother's family members. Uh, and if my understanding is correct, it's kind of at their whim as to whether or not you get to see or talk to the kids. On December 16th, APTN's In Focus aired Lauren's story. That same day, Lauren says Nizga stepped in and arranged a visitation with his grandsons and ended his hunger strike. And I'm grateful for that, to see them after not seeing them all this time, but it's just light at the end of the tunnel. By no way is it uh, the end, but at least it's the beginning. Hopefully we could work things out in a good way. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Terrace. We want to hear what you think about Lorne and his hunger strike. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. 
You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and now TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. A major weapons and drug bust happened on Tyendinaga Mohawk Territory in Ontario. Two homes were raided early Thursday morning. Four people from both Tyendinaga and nearby Deseronto have been arrested on drug and gun charges. Police confiscated a quantity of drugs and over 20 firearms, including a flamethrower. Those arrested are being charged with possession and the improper storage of firearms, as well as possession of illegal substances for the purpose of trafficking. Tyendinaga Police Chief Jason Brandt said this is the biggest bust in the two and a half years he's been chief. OPP Inspector Scott Semple says it's an example of the two police services working together. We feel this is important to showcase that you know we are working together and uh, you know maybe send the message to organized crime that you know you can't necessarily go and hide in a community that the police work together and we will work together to to find you and uh, take you to task for your activities that victimize our communities. Uh, we have no tolerance for this in our communities, nor does Tainanega Mohawk Territory. Emergency food security in Indigenous communities got a boost today as the Prime Minister announced details of a $100 million fund. From his cottage at Rideau Hall, Justin Trudeau reiterated an announcement from his agricultural minister. The $100 million is not new funding. It was announced in October. But today the Prime Minister said a substantial portion will go to Indigenous communities. This morning, Minister Bibo outlined the details of where that additional funding will go, including $30 million for food security in First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities. With these funds, food banks, local food organizations and Indigenous groups will be able to purchase and safely distribute food to help vulnerable people and communities. In a historic move, U.S. President-elect Joe Biden appointed Deb Holland to lead the U.S. Interior Department. Holland will be the first Native American to serve as a cabinet secretary. Those of us north of the border might be asking, what exactly does this mean? Aliyah Chavez, a reporter with Indian Country Today, joins us now from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to break things down. Aliyah, thank you for joining us. This is uh, very exciting news. So Canadians uh, may not understand what exactly uh, the Department of the Interior entails. Uh, in simple terms, what portfolios or issues will Holland now oversee? Definitely. The Interior Department is actually tasked with protecting the United States' natural resources. So that's a vast majority of the public lands, the coastal waters, but also uh, the nation's national parks. Um, in addition to that, however, they're also responsible with honoring the United States' uh, federal responsibility to tribal nations. So to do that, they also oversee a lot of really important important departments like the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Indian Ed Education, and actually, fun fact, the Interior Department employs more than 70,000 people. So it's a very large government agency. And uh, head of Indian Affairs is a controversial position here in Canada. Uh, what do you think are the implications of appointing an Indigenous woman to lead Indian Affairs? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think to put simply, I mean, having Representative Deb Holland at the very front of the table at the Department of the Interior is bound to make some pretty big changes. For uh, you know, more than 200 years, there's only ever been um, white men and actually two women who have served before her. And so to have a woman who grew up in her tribal community and who is very, very uh, well prepared for this position, I think is going to um, make a huge impact. We're going to be able to see that in the types of um, issues that they tackle, the, even the people that they hire. I think up and down the board, we're going to be able to see some pretty significant changes. And I also do want to mention, you know, a lot of it um, will involve working with a lot of other government agencies or government officials. So we won't see changes overnight, but definitely in terms of the previous history, I can imagine that there will be leaps and bounds um, under her, her tenure. 
And Aliyah, the Trump administration issued a series of glossy press releases about their achievements in Indian affairs before the presidential election, uh, including creation of a task force for missing and murdered uh, indigenous women. Would you say there's been progress in the last four years, or, or is Holland's work now cut out for her? I actually uh, spoke to Representative Holland about that in particular. I asked her about the task force that you're mentioning. And, you know, I think a lot of people feel that regardless of what administration um, is, is making the decisions at this point, that tackling MMIW is such an important issue that, you know, a lot of people really want to see a lot of changes there. I think in terms of what um, Ms. Holland could potentially work on while she's uh, leading the interior department there are a number of um issues that i imagine she'll have to tackle a lot of those being uh protecting sacred sites under the trump administration while he was building the wall in the southern border near mexico there actually were a handful of tribes whose um, sacred sites were demolished by uh, dynamite in order to build that wall and so i imagine you know being able to talk to those tribal nations and hopefully make amends is going to be a pretty big priority and uh, Aliyah, putting your reporter hat down for a minute here how did you personally react to this news Oh my goodness, that's such a great question. I, I think I've been in such a unique position. I'm actually from a Pueblo nation that really isn't far from uh, Representative Holland. And, and growing up, I can tell you that I never thought that I would be able to see news like this, let alone report it. And so, um, you know, for that, I'm extremely grateful to um, have this story for not only, you know, the people here in the United States, but also for Indigenous people everywhere. Um, when Representative Holland issued a tweet last night, it was her first remarks. Um, I actually wrote it down here. She said, uh, growing up in my mother's Pueblo household made me fierce. I'll be fierce for all of us, our planet and all of our protected land. I am honored and ready to serve. And I just thought that that was a beautiful way um, to say that she accepted the position. And I can tell you as a Pueblo reporter myself um, that it has been a very exciting assignment. Perfect, thanks Aliyah. That's Aliyah Chavez from Indian Country Today joining us from New Mexico. Thanks so much for having me. We have to take a short break, but coming up, a lifeline is being thrown to help Yukon artists sell their wares. It's the loss of the gatherings. It's, it's uh, the loss of the craft markets and sales, and we see it again this Christmas. Welcome back. With so many businesses struggling to stay profitable during the pandemic, many have gone online to survive. And this Christmas, virtual marketplaces are a hot commodity. APTN Simon Charlin takes a look at one virtual market that, is, that has Christmas shoppers from around the world. All right, this order, two hemp seed and tea tree oil, one peachy keen, three lavender bath bomb, and one nitty gritty. Businesses booming at Sister Sage in U.S. Minster, B.C., where founder Lynn Mary Angus handcrafts wellness and self-care products inspired by her Gikatla, Nishka, and Métis heritage. It was a pretty hectic, and we at some points had four of us in here uh, working on shipping, packing, um, inventory, and just trying to get everybody's orders out in time for the holidays. To replace lost business from trade shows and door sales, they have been relying on the online community and new initiatives. Shop Indigenous Women's Holiday Market is one of them. It's a Facebook-based operation that helps Indigenous women as well as non-binary artists who have seen their sales decline since COVID-19 hit in the spring. For founder Michelle Young-Crook, creating the market was a no-brainer. It was a void that needed to be filled. Like, there's so many people out there saying how they want to make a difference and they want to do these things, and no one was really coming to the table with anything. And, you know, and now everybody's kind of wanting to do economic reconciliation, and this is the easiest way to do it. Like, put your money where your mouth is. The private Facebook group was launched on November 7. The virtual market has quickly gone viral and already has nearly 40,000 members. Consumers looking for unique creations and artists sharing their skills and their stories. Tracy Metallic is a Mi'kmaq artist from Restigouche, Quebec. A former social worker, she used to teach classes on healing. Struggling with stress and depression, 
she took a break from teaching to pick up a paintbrush and started practicing what she preached in class. She's now making a living off her creations. My day is jam-packed. And it's right now, it's just art. I'm packing, I'm shipping, I'm packing, I'm shipping, I'm running out of prints. Like this market has just been amazing. Like the opportunities that, that have come forward, I'm just, I'm shipping all over the place. The Canadian-based marketplace has gone international with vendors and buyers all around the world. Like I was on there and I saw a couple of Indigenous people from Australia and Chile, uh, New Zealand, the U.S. Like it's great. And the only thing I ask is that they're able to ship to Canada. That's the only requirement I have. And when business is this good, there's no need to stop. I've decided I'm just going to keep it going forever. Like there's no re there's always a reason to shop. You know, there's birthdays, there's holidays, there's because you just want to go shopping because it's COVID and you're bored. <laughs> so there's always a reason to spend money. And, you know, it's not like anybody's going to stop making product or anything like that. So artists will continue to share their craft long after the holiday season is over. Simon Charlin, APTN National News, Vancouver. It's been a tough year for many Indigenous artists. With COVID-19 cancelling events and festivals where artists and crafters sell their work, many have had to deal with the loss of sales in a market that's already known for being unstable and low-paying. But thanks to a First Nations association in the Yukon, things are starting to look up for struggling artists in that territory. Here's Sarah Connors with that story. Which an artist Sharon Vitrigla is a successful master beater and crafter. She expected to sell her items at several festivals and markets this year, but when COVID hit the Yukon in March, most events were cancelled and her job stability went out the window. It's been really rough. Um, for one thing, uh, not having enough uh, unemployment short hours. I would say upwards of 30. Courtney Holmes is the Yukon First Nations Culture and Tourism uh, Association's months. Arts Program Coordinator. She says the pandemic has had a significant impact on artists in the territory. It's the loss of the gatherings. It's, it's uh, the loss of the craft markets and sales. And we see it again this Christmas as well with a, um, a real restriction on what's being offered. With the average Indigenous artist making just over $16,000 a year, the pandemic has had a devastating effect. According to a national survey launched earlier this year, the average artist or craftsperson lost or was at risk of losing $32,000 worth in opportunities. And the expected total revenue loss for the arts industry in 2020 is $20.7 million. As a result, the association launched an online store late this summer to help artists who have lost opportunities due to the virus. The store works by advertising artists' products through their online platform and social media channels, connecting them with customers in the Yukon and beyond free of charge. These are some beautiful mukluks made by... She like says so far the store has Christine been fairly Sam. successful and has made more than $10,000 in commissions for 30 artists be, uh, since it launched. Um, the artists will bring in their work and then we will we offer to photograph it for them, put it on the online store. The association helps artists with marketing and takes high quality photos of artists items, a major help in today's competitive marketplace. For artists like Vitraqua with no marketing experience, the store has helped enhance the look of her products. The work that they've done is just absolutely amazing. You know, and taking even taking pictures of your artwork, you know, it's so beautiful. Vitraqua is now one of the store's top sellers and has sold upwards of 30 items. Thank God I am busy with orders and like pair slippers that takes uh, takes a lot of time. It'll take about 50 to 66 hours. The association will continue to monitor the store to see if they'll keep it running past the pandemic. And while it isn't meant to be a main avenue for artists to generate revenue, it is a resource that people like Vitraqua are thankful for during a time when they need all the help they can get. I've been getting a lot more clients and I'm getting a lot more from around the world, which is just absolutely fabulous for me, is getting getting my work out there and so that they can support the artists of the, the North. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. It's great to see these artists still being able to sell their work even during this pandemic. We have to take one more break, but coming up, a COVID-19 briefing in Nunavut brings some good news regarding one very special traveler. I'm very, very excited to let all young Nunavut mule know that Santa Claus has been approved to come into the territory without having to self-isolate for 14 days.
Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. This one comes to us from three of our favorite little elves here at the APTN headquarters in Winnipeg. Thomas is on the left, Alan the tall elf is in the middle, and Brittany is on the right. They took a moment for this shot to be taken in our newsroom. And for the rest of you outside the newsroom, keep those pictures coming to share at aptn.ca. We'll do our best to get them on the air. And now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Beginning in eastern Canada, plus one in snow in St. John's and plus two in Halifax. Minus 12 in Happy Valley Goose Bay and minus nine in Sun in Cartwright. Minus 13 in Quebec City and minus two in Val d'Or. Zero degrees in snow in Peterborough and four degrees in Sarnia. Zero degrees in snow in Timmins and minus, thick, minus six in Thunder Bay. Minus 18 in snow in Thompson and minus eight in the Paw. Minus two in Winnipeg and plus one in Brandon. Plus one in snow in Regina and zero degrees in Saskatoon. Minus 12 in snow in LaRange and minus 25 in Stony Rapids. Over in Western Canada, minus 20 in snow in Fort McMurray and minus two in Grand Prairie. Minus three in Edmonton and plus five in Calgary. Six degrees in Penticton and three degrees in Quesnel. Minus 19 in Fort Nelson and plus three in Prince George. Minus 32 in Dawson and minus 38 in Old Crow. Minus 31 in snow in Yellowknife and minus 40 in Norman Wells. Minus 36 in Colville Lake and minus 34 in Fort McPherson. Minus 37 in Baker Lake and minus 28 in Chesterfield. Minus 25 in Clyde River and minus 30 in Sun and Cloud in Resolute. Today, the Nunavut government gave their last update about COVID-19 until the new year, and it contained plenty of good news. Nunavut now has 34 active cases of COVID-19. Just a week ago, it was 56. All of the cases are in Arviat, and to date, 225 Nunavuniats have recovered from COVID-19. That news cleared the path for an announcement about one essential worker who will not have to quarantine before visiting the territory next week. I'm very, very excited to let all young Nunavut Mule know that Santa Claus has been approved to come into the territory without having to self-isolate for 14 days. That's a good thing. This will allow him to continue making toys with the elves and preparing for a very busy Christmas Eve. So please don't worry, Santa Claus is indeed coming to town in Nunavut this year. It sounds like Santa Claus and his elves will be very busy for Christmas, which is wonderful to hear. That does it for this edition of APTN National News. For more Indigenous news, you can visit our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Have a great night.